So yes, you're going to get two talks for the price of one here, because I'm going to talk about Borg to get us started and then explain how that fed into our open source Kubernetes project that we is now available on GitHub. So a quick question, has anybody here used Gmail or Google Web Search or Google Docs or, okay, fine. Those things, those things run on Borg. Pretty much everything inside Google, except Borg itself, runs on top of Borg. It's our container management engine, a sort of coordination thing for the clusters. So I need to say one time, just to keep the lawyers happy, that this is the system we internally call Borg to avoid trademark issues. But uh, no, we got that out of the way. Great. Um, and the other thing I need to say is that I'm just the guy standing up here with the slides. These people did all the work that I'm going to describe. So if you have any questions, you can ask any of them. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll be delighted to answer anything that you can come up with. So you probably know, because you've seen this on the web, that there is a bunch of Google data centers scattered across the globe. Here's the last set of pins that I found from a few months back. Uh, you know, we're adding new ones every now and again. Um, those things are big, and they're getting bigger. We used to build sort of football uh, field-sized data centers, but that got eh. So now we're building four floor football field-sized data centers, because one floor isn't enough, apparently. Uh, this is an artist's rendition of what the one in Singapore is going to look like. See the old one on the right-hand side and the new shiny one on the left um, for scale, tree, other tree, car, etc. These things are absolutely enormous. I mean, I've been in one, and it just keeps on going and going and going, and you sort of think, surely, no, it keeps on going and going. Um, fortunately, nobody actually, you know, very few people have to go inside these things. They're loud, they're hot, they're noisy, and really not a nice place to work. There's large amounts of bare metal with sharp edges on them. So you don't want software engineers anywhere near bare metal with sharp edges on it, right? Because you know it's going to be bad. Um, pretty pictures get happen before we let anybody into them or before we do any upgrades. So this is a brand new shiny data center. It's never going to be this regular again. Uh, <laughs> back then, whoops, we that was exciting. Um, this thing here is, is the, the networking racks that we uh, actually published a paper about more recently. So since we took this photograph, we've actually been able to talk about what's behind the curtain. Um, but what I'm going to do is to talk about what it's like as a, a, an internal user for that big toy, uh, sorry, uh, data center tool that we have available. Um, think, by the way, for scale, we're talking a couple of hundred million dollars worth of kit. So it's kind of useful for us to try and make sure we use it efficiently, and that's really where Borg comes in. So here's the user experience. So I, I as a, as a user of this stuff, you don't thankfully go into this data center, you sit at your desktop and you type away and you generate a sort of configuration file. Here's a description of what I want to have run where. And I cast around for a really good example that would display all the subtleties and complexities of the things we do inside Google. And I found Hello World, which is a nice use case you get to do when you first join. You get to do these code labs which are follow along with me while we go try to break the world. Um, in this case, just run Hello World somewhere. So. What you write is a configuration file. I'm going to give you a sort of a rendition of it. It's about the right scale for, for this particular app. And you say, first of all, it's a job. Well, a job for us is just a collection of tasks. A task is a, is a container, typically running a Linux uh, process group. And a job is just a collection of basically identical tasks. So first of all, you name your job. And then you say, I'd like to run it somewhere. And you get to pick a cell. So I talked a moment ago about clusters, and we actually have a terminology difference. A cluster for us is a pile of networking, sorry, a pile of machines connected by a high-speed network in one building, one building fabric. A cell is a lump of those machines carved out as a single management unit for Borg. So typically, you'll have one big cell in each cluster. Clusters have two-letter names. Therefore, most Borg cells have two-letter names. There's a few exceptions. Um, and why would you do that? Well, because these are units of management and control, and occasionally people screw up. My colleague, I will not name him, uh, one of my SRE colleagues did the, um, wanted to drain one of these cells, which means take everything, all the applications that are running in it, and turn them off so we can do something drastic to the cell, like maintain it. So he typed the command on the command line to drain the cell and hit enter, and then went off to the website to sort of check that the right thing had happened, and nothing had changed. Hmm. So like any good software engineer, he just typed the same command again, and hit enter. <laughs> and it turned out that he had drained a cell, just not that cell. 
For calibration, a median sized cell is 10,000 machines. <laughs> so accidents happen, and you would rather not have one command line take down the whole of a large site for us, like Atlanta, which is a multi building site with multiple cells inside it. So you get to pick a cell. A cell is just a place where you get to run one of these, these, these jobs. Um, and then you get to say things like, here's my program, which typically we compile ahead of time in the cloud. You get to say a few pass line <coughs> command line arguments to this thing. And one particular thing that we do for Hello World is going to be a web server, um, is we have to tell it which port to serve on. Because it might be that two or three of my Hello World instances will end up on the same machine. So they can't all serve on port 80. So this is just the syntax to say, Borg, pick a port for me. And we do this because we, back when this was done, we only had IPv4 addresses, so we had to find some way to share the port space. And this is the way to do it, just get Borg to do the work. And then you could choose to specify things like how much memory, how much disk space, how much CPU cycles to use in terms of cores um, that you would like your application to, to, to have access to. Um, 100 megs sounds a little large, and it turns out that's because we do statically linked binaries, because they survive things like OS upgrades. They just keep on ticking. Um, so Hello World is something like 70 megabytes, I think. We've got a lot of stuff in there. For example, every, pretty much every application that you run inside Google, even Hello World, has a little web server built into it for things like, what is its RPC performance like? What's its memory usage like? Give me a little graph of how long it took to do various things. I mean, all of those things are available in the monitoring system, and that's how the rest of the monitoring system finds out what's going on and draws nice pretty little graphs that our SRE friends look at. And then you can say, uh, sort of, how many copies, how many replicas of this task would I like? So five seems a reasonable number of Hello World just to get it started. Hold on, why am I being reasonable? Let's try something more interesting. <laughs> so I did, um, actually from home. I just got home, got off the bus, opened up my laptop, typed in the command to sort of all config and said, great, let's fire off 10,000 copies of Hello World in some random cell. I think IC is in Iowa, but I had to actually look it up. I, I, the first time I ran this, this uh, thing, I, it told me to use you know, some cell, and I had no idea where it was. Some months later, I found out it was in Belgium. Eh. I mean, you really don't care, right? You care about things like where it is for your end user latencies. You care about making sure you've got enough copies of them scattered across the planet. So if one of them goes down, the others stay up. But you really, I mean, you just two letter names is what you change to cause that, that differentiation. So this is what happened. So then I went, how am I going to display to anybody hello world, right? 10,000 copies is a bit tedious to go type, type on. So what I found instead was just a, I went to the Borg master, which is sort of the central control for each cell, and said, how many copies of my hello world are you running? And here's the graph of elapsed time, number of copies in the y-axis, time along here. And it took two and a half minutes to go from zero to 10,000 copies of hello world. And my reaction was, good grief, that's slow. <laughs> I've been at Google too long. I've been spoiled. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, so I, don't, I didn't actually dig down in gory detail, but the rough, rough gist of it is as follows. I run Hello World at the lowest possible priority, which means if there was any other useful work that cell could be doing, it would do that first. Right? So I'm at the lowest thing it's going to get around to dealing with. And then the other is probably I'd only just compiled it, so it hadn't had a chance to sort of propagate the, the, the 70 mega binary that took a great many different storage servers. So we're probably bandwidth limited on the smallest number of storage servers that have the relevant bits of my binary. Once you've got it into memory, then it's sort of we use a bit torrent like tree distribution, but if the source is still a single bottleneck, then it, it turns out it's, it's a bit of an issue. And spread over two and a half minutes, it turns out that not everything is, is, uh, is, does the bit torrent distribution as quickly as possible. So that's still pretty nice, you know, zero to 10,000 with just, you know, I could change the 10,000 to 4,000 or something. 10,000 was the maximum I was permitted, it turned out, so that's why I picked it. By the way, I didn't have to ask anybody for permission. I just did this, just for fun. I did remember to take it down afterwards. So what happened behind the scenes? So this is a picture of a Borg cell, you know, one particular rendition of it. Across the bottom here, we have machines. Each one of them runs an agent called the Borglet, which is sort of keeps an eye on what's going on on that machine. In the center of the picture is a thing called the Borgmaster, which is, the, you know, as you might expect, it's the thing in charge of the, of the cell. We actually keep five copies of it because, you know, things break. In fact, one of the themes of this talk is going to be, you know, things break. Um, you've got to get used to that. We look like we stay up from the outside. You know, we get sort of four nines, four and a half nines reliability for, from the exterior because we assume that everything on the inside is falling apart. Right? This is the only way we get reliability to the outside. We just do not tolerate single points of failure. And I include things like data centers as a single point of failure in that analysis. Except for Hello World, I only ran it in one place. 
Um, so what had happened at the beginning is that I pre-compiled my binary and I sort of I ran a, a parallel compilation activity that ran somewhere in the cloud. I don't know where it ran. I don't care. I don't have to know. It just executed. Um, the tool it used to decide what to execute uh, is internally called Blaze. Externally, it's called Bazel, and you can get it yourself, right? If you haven't looked at it yet, um, correct, fast, pick any two is their slogan. Uh, it's a spectacularly good sort of automatic dependency analysis. It makes look, make look sort of, you know, so last century. It just works. It just gets everything right. Anyway, so that was used to, to compile all of these bits and pieces. And then I took that configuration file I showed you and ran a command called Borg config up, which says, I want to bring up a copy of that, uh, that, uh, that job. And that we did an RPC to the Borg master in cell IC. It did a few checks first to make sure I was allowed to do this. And the Borg master took a copy of that request and wrote it to a persistent store. So we happen to use Paxos internally, which is one reason why five copies is a magic useful number. Paxos works well with that. And Borgmaster wrote it, the representation of John wants to run 10,000 copies of Hello World down to Paxos, and replied saying, got it. Success. I have received your request. I haven't done anything about it yet, but I've received your request. So now if my client falls over, Borgmaster's going to keep going. If one of the copies of Borgmaster falls over, one of the other four copies will pick up and keep going. For some little time later, a separate process happens, um, it runs the scheduler, and it has an in-memory copy of that persistent state. And it looks at the copy of the persistent state and says, huh, that's funny, there's a request here from John to run 10,000 copies of Hello World, and I can't find a single one of them with a place to run. Hmm, let's fix that. So in batches of order of magnitude 200 at a time, it goes and finds places, sort of the right-sized hole somewhere on that uh, cell of 10,000 machines, and records the fact that it wants to run one copy here, one copy there, two copies there, and writes that out to the persistent store. And then goes back and see if it has anything else to do, and repeats, just keeps on going over a couple, up a couple of minutes. In particular, it goes back and sees, does anybody have any real work that I can do? Because, you know, hello world, so boring. Some little while later, yet another component inside the Borgmaster called the link shard, and there's sort of, we, we actually, um, this basically goes around and polls all of the Borglets, right? So we've got five copies of the Borgmaster, we just divide the work by five, so each Borgmaster instance runs five of them, runs a, a set of link shards. They talk, at, talk to Borglet and said, so what are you running now? And they say, great, the Borglet reports back, here's what I'm doing, and the link shard compares that with a copy of the persistent state and says, huh, that's funny, you should be running a copy of John's Hello World, let's fix that. So it sends down the command to the Borglet to go grab itself a copy of Hello World from the binary and start running it. And that's basically how you get to 10,000 copies of Hello World. I didn't check all 10,000. I did check a few and they were there and they all said Hello World. <laughs> okay, it wasn't, I told you it wasn't that exciting a demo, but it was a great way to, of, of telling the story. Um, I drew that line quite thick for a couple of reasons. One is that it would show up nicely on the graph, and the second is to elide a little bit of information about exactly what's going on. 10,000 turns out to be very large, and at this scale, 10,000 pixels don't fit nicely on the screen, so what's actually happening at the top is that it never quite got to 10,000 copies. The biggest number I ever saw was 9,993, and I sort of watched it for 15, 20 minutes or so. Hmm, that's odd. So here's just a, a screen snapshot of, of the part of the Borgmaster um, UI. So of the seven things that are missing, uh, one of them is pending, which means it's waiting for the scheduler to find a place for it. And five of them are in setup, which is basically that stage of copying over the bits from, uh, from, uh, for the binary to run. And one of them has sort of disappeared into the ether. It'll come back. It just doesn't show up on this part of the, of the picture. What? what? What could possibly be happening here? Well. This is a picture of what life is like if you're a task running in one of these environments. So the horizontal axis is basically how often bad stuff will happen to you, measured in number of times per, ex per uh, week of running time. The top, the top bar on the left is short. If you're a production job, you're running at priority 200-ish or thereabouts, which is what we use to define things like uh, web search and Google Docs and Gmail and all those kind of things you actually use for real. Life is pretty good. The number of interruptions you get is quite small. In particular, once you've found 
a space, almost nobody else is going to evict you. The only people that will be able to evict you are, the only, people, the only, only tasks be able to evict you are higher priority ones, and the only ones higher priority from production are the monitoring system, right? So the monitoring system is the most important thing that we run. Everything else is just something you keep an eye on. Oh, and by the way, they have side effects like Google Docs. But why does that go down? Well, because we do an OS upgrade on every machine about once a month. And that turns out to be enough to call that, cause that raise of evictions. So basically, everything that's running on that machine has to be killed because we're going to do a reboot. So we tap them on the shoulder and say, you're about to be killed. And if they do something about it, that's great. If they don't do something about it, we kill them. If you're not a production task, if you're lower priority than, than 120, like if you're a, I don't know, a batch job, or even at the bottom of the pile if you're Hello World, then any production job that shows up that wants the resources you're using wins. If you don't get out of the way, you will be moved out of the way. How do we do that? We kill you. <laughs> There's a theme here, right? It's quite easy. Um, so your life is less fun. This is actually average across all of the non-production bands. And as you'll see over here, you know, we're talking order of magnitude, eight evictions per task week. Well, I told you 10,000 was a lot. 10,000 tasks running simultaneously is burning about a task week a minute. So we expect to see order of magnitude half a dozen to a dozen evictions per minute on my sets of Hello World stuff. Probably a little higher because uh, I'm lower priority than this average represents. So all we just were watching before was the natural churn of somebody else coming in wanting the resources that my Hello World was squatting on and saying, get out of the way. <laughs> Repeat. Um, and it takes about 30 seconds-ish or so to copy over a few tens of megabytes of binary to put them onto the local disk to, to start up the new copy of it. So that was all that was happening. It was just gentle churn taking place inside the environment. And this is normal. I mean, this is the one change that I found when I went into Google from my previous life. I used to do high reliability storage systems for a living. And we were quite proud at the fact, of course, they were storage systems. Of course, they, would leave, they wouldn't lose data. And then we worried about how to make them fast and cost effective. And I get to Google and people say, fast, cost effective. Yes, we can do that. Brute force is a powerful tool. Now, let's talk about when things break. And all of the design discussions are about when things break, because this is happening. But because we write software to cope with this happening, it looks like the aggregate set of things stays up all the time because you can't rely on any single thing being up. You cannot get attached to any instance of what you're running. So the result is if you're running, let's say, I mean, Google Calendar what, 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 at one point was around this scale. An instance of Google Calendar touches order of magnitude 2,000 machines. You will see, even if for production tasks, you'll see about 10 of those vanishing a day. Nobody gets paged. This is perfectly normal. What Borg will do is it will find another place to go run you if you're lucky, or if it's really tight, you may have to wait a while before you come back. But the expected SLO is you'll find another place in about 10 to 15 minutes or less. And the main thing I want to get you to think about here is that do not think of this as abnormal. This is reality. This is how you get things to, to, to scale and to stay up. Scale itself turns out not to be very hard. It's the consequences of scale are interesting. And we are basically spending our lives living in the tail behavior. When you've got 10,000 of something, something weird is happening to the last five all the time. And if you can get those five to behave themselves well, then the other 9,000, whatever, is going to be doing great. OK. And if you haven't already met it, this is a couple of hundred pages, maybe a bit more, of distilled wisdom on a whole bunch of the topics around this general area from my SRE colleagues. I wrote, helped write one little chapter, but they did almost all the work. Um, go get yourself a copy and read it and actually then apply those ideas. Um, there's a whole bunch of spectacularly good wisdom. Whether or not you have an SRE organization or not, just how to think about what it means to bring a system up and keep it up. If it isn't up, it doesn't matter how fast it is. If it isn't up, it doesn't matter how cost effective it is. Get it up first, and then we can have the second conversation. OK, any questions, actually, by the way? I'm in jet lag purgatory right now, so keep me awake, please. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's have that second conversation. Let's actually talk about efficiency and cost effectiveness. Does anybody here use uh, Google Compute Platform, uh, GCE VMs, or anything else like that? Cool. OK, a few of you. Good. One of these might be yours. Uh, each of these color bars represents, um, a, 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 we did a snapshot, an experiment, some external virtual machine that was running. And the reason I'm showing you this is to talk about the way we do bin packing of work onto machines. 
right? We don't just run one VM on a machine, we run many VMs on a machine. Um, externally, we use VMs because the, w the outside world is a very nasty place. <laughs> Internally, we don't use VMs. Uh, we best just use containers, so that's good enough for us because of the other software checks we have in place. But externally, we have our security folk require an X level of, of isolation from us. But this is just a graph of one cell. Um, well, actually, a tiny fraction of one cell that goes off far to this side over here. Uh, each vertical line represents one physical machine, and I'm plotting here the amount of uh, CPU that's in use or allocated at the top and the amount of memory that's been allocated at the bottom. And the point of this is to s talk about a couple of things. Um, the first is there are more than, there's more than one VM on the machine. Great. We do the same internally as well. The second is to say, look, when we're trying to place a new VM, you need to find a place with white space. Right? So white space itself, when you've got both CPU and memory free is not too bad, unless you've got too much white space, because that just meant you bought too many machines. That was expensive. This is what you want to avoid. Free memory, but no CPU, or free CPU, but no memory. There is no way you can sell that to anybody else or use it for anything else we might do. So we call that resource stranding, and we work quite hard in our scheduling algorithms to avoid the stuff in pink. So most of the effort we take is sort of how do you do sort of dynamic on the fly bin packing at the scale I talked about in a few uh, fr fraction of a second while still avoiding things like that, which makes it kind of interesting. Um, I mentioned that we ran more than one thing on a machine. This is a graph from late 2012 of how many tasks we put on each machine. Back then, the median was order magnitude 12. It basically scales with core count, so it's probably roughly doubled since then. Right, we, just, we just keep on buying new generation machines and they, they have more cores on them. Um, the board master load roughly scales with core count as well. Right? We, we talk about sort of th two, th three interesting metrics for how big a cell is, how many machines there are, how many cores it has, and how many megawatts. So we have conversations around megawatts, which is interesting. The other conversations we have is, is petabytes. I was shared a, uh, an office with a guy once who said, I found a way to save 50 petabytes of doing something of this space. And a little while later, one of us looked at the other and said, is that a lot? And we, and we actually had to go and think, and it turns out, yes, that, that is a lot even for us. But we had to think about it for a while. <laughs> okay. So in the process of sort of trying to write up some and, and share our experiences with some of this stuff, we, uh, you know, I, I, I write papers as a, uh, as a fun hobby. Um, we, we, I wanted to ask a few questions. And one, one of the standard things, you know, I told you that we, we, we share machines between different applications. And you say, well, why? And the answer, because it, we mean we can buy fewer machines that way, right? Machines are expensive things in, in this kind of scale. Great, I said, great, how much does it save? What? We didn't know. So then we started asking, great, how would we find out? Well, you could, let's, uh, oh, how would you find out? So it turns out if you've got a cell that's running some workload and you change the scheduling algorithm to do something different to it, unless you're crazy, it's still gonna fit. So you can't actually evaluate scheduling algorithms very easily just by leaving things alone. There are two things you can do. You can take the workload and you grow it until it no longer fits. But that has all sorts of problems about how do you, how do you grow something? Do you add more jobs? Do you add more tasks? Do you make the tasks bigger? Do you do all of the above? What do you do about these things called constraints, which say, I will only run on things that are this scale, etc. Or you could do the other thing, which is what we did for this paper, which is you can say you could take the workload and take the original cell and just squeeze it until things no longer fit. And you could do that with binary search, and you know, we've got machines. Eh. Um, so that's what we did. So this is a graph of, of what happened. Oh, by the way, we wrote a five-page paper about how do you evaluate scheduling algorithms using these two techniques about and, and comparing them. If you care, I can tell you some, send you a pointer. Um, so here's a graph of original cell. Um, which is actually running a shared workload. So we're running both production stuff and batch jobs in the same cell in, with this picture. That's the dark blue bar. And the dark blue bar represents the smallest number of machines you could possibly use to run that workload. Right? You just take them out at random, so you keep the mix of the sizes the same, because they're not all uniform. You would never do that, right? That would be crazy. You always want some headroom, because things are always going out for repair, people are changing their minds about how much they want. I mean, all that kind of stuff happens. So this is not... You wouldn't run it this way, but it's a great way of doing repeatable evaluations, which is what we were interested in. And then we said, well, what happens if we just took away all of the batch workload and just only ran the production user-facing stuff? So this sort of low latency uh, web search or um, external access RPCs or web servers. And this is how many machines it would take, the minimum number you would get away with. And then if we ran those batch jobs in a separate cell, this is how many machines it would take to do that. 
you'll notice that the blue bar on the left is shorter than the sum of the blue bars on the right. And that gap is how many extra machines you would have to buy just to run these two things separately rather than together. A policy statement. Nothing better is happening. We're just making a policy choice to run them in separate environments, which is why we don't. There are some people who do this. Good for them. This is why we don't. <laughs> so the overhead metric, we, we actually talk now. I'm going to take the next graph, take this graph, and just shift it by 90 degrees. So this is a graph of essentially that same bar chart with the overhead value here um, for 15 different cells. So we, we selected the cells as, as follows. This is actually the most fun sentence to write in the whole paper. We took all of our cells, we sorted them by core count, and we threw away all the small ones, by which I mean 5,000 machines or less. And then we randomly sampled what was left to get 15. So the, somewhere in this 15 is a very big one, somewhere in this 15 is something a medium size, 10,000, and somewhere in here is a smallish one in the around five to 6,000. And you can read the paper for why there's error bars, um, but the thing to observe is that all of the area up at the top left-hand corner is money that we would have to spend if we just change the policy of running things together on the same machines. And that's a lot of money. We would have to grow, on average, uh, by about 25%. Remember that picture with a map of data centers? Imagine adding a quarter as many of those little red pins. $200 million a pop. Let's not do that. So we don't. Other kind of things you could ask. So we did, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm going to just pick a couple here. Um, what happens if we made ourselves smaller? You know, 10,000 seems large. What would happen if we made them 5,000 or 3,000? And the answer is, guess what? You'd have more fragmentation. More fragmentation means more machines to run the same workload. So it turns out bigger cells are better. The upper bound is primarily dictated by a couple of things. One is the sort of power density we get inside data centers, and then the other is my friends in the SRE profession who will occasionally mistype commands. Um, so again, we're talking uh, 20 to 50 percent extra just, just for a policy choice of having smaller cells. The networking can do, can do it just fine. Here's another thing you've looked at. So we let our people, I'll show you a graph in a second, we let our users say, I want this many bytes of memory to the byte. Um, we let them say how many CPU cores they want to the millicore, and so on, right, for dip all the different resource types. What would happen if we said, how about we insist that you do what our external people do in VMs and round it up to the nearest power of two in each of those dimensions? Guess what? You'd need more machines. And depending on what you do about things when you round them up, they get bigger than the machine is, which is the difference between the blue graph and the green graph. The blue one, we just threw them, throw them away. The green graph, we capped them to the machine size. You'd need, on average, again, something somewhere in this range here, right? 30% more machines if you rounded things up to powers of two. Hmm. So we don't internally. And this, by the way, is one of the motivations why we came out with this uh, GCE custom machine types, right? Rather than forcing you to pick from just a limited menu of, of shapes of this much GCU means you have to have this much memory, uh, CPU memory, we'll let you pick independently within reasonable ratios. Six more cores, great. This much RAM to go with it you will save money by doing so. So this is actually what people do. This is a, uh, a CDF of, on the, the x-axis, a log axis of the amount of memory or CPU cores that people request for both production work and non-production work. Um, and also the dashed, the funny dashed line thingy is the, the ratio between the two. And it's an S-curve, right? So a couple of things to notice. The numbers in the middle are more popular than the numbers on either end but the range is enormous. There is not a single answer. There are some popular answers. It's amazing how many machine, uh, sorry, how many applications need exactly one CPU core. Who knew? You know, after all the careful measurement that people do, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> what do you think is happening? They're just saying, I don't know, one, right? And if it's not right, well, we'll fix it later. Okay, great. <laughs> so nice round numbers are popular. Two is also interesting. Um, some of the numbers actually are automated, right? How would you do this by hand? You'd run something on your desktop and, and try it for a while, and if it, doesn't need, if it doesn't work, you'd give it a bit more. Well, why would we have people do this? We can have the system do it for you. So that's actually one of the things you can say, you choose. Here's another interesting set of numbers. These are people asking for tiny amounts of CPU. I mean, minuscule, uh, a 20th of a CPU core. Hmm. They're gaming the system. They're saying, I'm so small, you can pack me anywhere, quickly, easily, I, I'll fit in. 
And when I get there, I'm going to bet that no other people on that machine are not using all of the resources. I can just use the spare stuff. This worked wonderfully until we started doing best fit and put 200 of these things onto one machine. <laughs> It turned out to be easier to fix our scheduling algorithm than it was to change our user behavior. Oh well. Okay, so we see all, right, the point is you see a whole range of things here. Um, but I talked, this is what people ask for. That's not quite what they use. So I'll show you graphs in a second about the actual numbers. But, but here's the basic concept, right? We notice that people will ask for more than they need. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. For example, if you're running a sort of two plus one redundancy model, and you know, the plus one data set, and your load is spread evenly across all three, and, the, and one of them just disappears, that load has to go somewhere. We don't throw it away, we just spread it across the other two data centers. Global load balancing is a wonderful thing. You have a few seconds to respond, and your load will go up by 50%. So you had better be ready for that. Uh, we get workload spikes. Um, what some friends in SRE tell me that when Michael Jackson died, we saw what we thought was a denial of service attack on web search. <laughs> Uh, they were panicking. Blah, what's going on? Turned out it was just people looking it up. As I like to point out, think about what happens when he comes back. <laughs> so we try to scale things to cope with, 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 with that level of, sort of extra capacity. And then the other thing I need to tell you is that if you ask for a certain amount of, let's say, memory, and you need more memory than you have requested in your production job, we will, guess what? Kill you. So it's sensible to pad things upwards a little bit. Now, you actually have to pay for this. You know, as an as internal user, you, you, you have to fund this stuff. So there's some, some back pressure, but it's not a lot of back pressure. But here's what we observe, right? That people ask for, they have a large capacity, which is there in case of Black Sundays um, or Black Swan events. But their actual usage is, is typically a fraction of that, somewhere around half to a third. Um, so what we do inside Borg is we sort of keep an eye on the actual usage and say, you know, I'm going to bet that what you're currently doing is going to keep going for a while. So we build a little age-weighted average of the utilization, which we call the reservation, and then we get to take the stuff between the reservation and what we have reserved for you, because we will actually reserve it for you. you. You will pay for it. If you want it, it's there. But if you're not using it right now, we can run batch jobs in it. So that's exactly what we do. That's how we pack those batch jobs into the same machines that we're running production workloads in. Right? We take the stuff that's not currently being used by the production things and give it to the batch jobs. Batch jobs have a lousy existence already. Occasionally our uh, reservation estimates go wrong, we make a mistake, and we'll just make their existence a tiny bit more lousy. Eh. It's nice to have an error budget. Right? So how do we migrate a VM, or, sorry, a, 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 an internal task? You kill it and bring it up somewhere else. As long as you don't do this too frequently, and we actually publish numbers about what too frequently means, it's actually wonderful to have that degree of freedom to be able to do stuff behind the scenes. You'll notice, however, that there is a gap between the red line and the blue line at the bottom here, and that's sort of basically you know, safety margin, right? Sort of, we, we put that aside in case the, you know, the usage does something wacky, and we, you know, we, we, we might misestimate. There is nothing useful we can do with that safety margin. We can't run batch jobs in it. It's just put aside for a policy choice of how much we want to be safe in this reservation game. So let's see how much yellow there is. So here's a graph of a week of one actual live cell from uh, November 2013. And the thing to notice is that there's a lot of yellow. A lot of yellow. Usage at the bottom, so this is again CPU at the top, memory at the bottom. Um, the dark stuff is actual usage, the yellow is the, the, the safety margin, and the pale gray line at the top, uh, the wiggly one is the, uh, the actual request for that cell that people have come in and asked for. And somewhere on the bottom line, you can see at the memory line, there's a pale horizontal green gray bar back there, which is the actual capacity. So we're giving out more resources than we have. We're living a little dangerously, but we're giving it to batch jobs. And eh, there's a theme here. So we looked at this, we went, great, safety margin. Let's crank the safety margin down. So we, whoops, so we did. Great, much less yellow. Cool, success. What could possibly have gone wrong? Well, here's the graph. This is a cumulative graph of number of times we ran out of memory. And the slope is a little steeper than our SRE colleagues were happy with. That was the gist of their message. They were a touch less polite. But that was the gist of their message. So we said, okay, great, let's have put some of that slack back because clearly no slack is bad. So we ran for a week with basically sort of midway between the two, roughly half the amount of slack, so about half the amount of yellow. And if you look at the graph at the bottom, it's actually much 
flatter, there's a spike at the end and nobody's given me a good excuse as to why that's happening. We claim it wasn't us and we've got away with it. Um, and then just to make sure that, that we hadn't actually broken the world or the world hadn't changed under our feet, we then went back to the original settings. So the first week and the last week are actually the original settings for how much slack. So there's a bit of variation across time. Um, but as you can see here, you know, we were able in the week three, we could save a moderately large amount of, of yellow. So this, uh, which is actually what we did, we turned on that setting for the middle. So we've saved the company a few percent of the fleet. A few percent of the fleet, the entire thing, by writing this paper. Excellent. Okay. So one last thing on this, this topic I want to get to is that was sort of roughly, we spend our lives worrying about how do we make bin packing things more efficiently, how do we increase the response time, how we give people more features that they would like to be able to do exercise control and sort of get this kind of efficiency out of our system. Because that makes our costs lower, right? If we can reuse the machines better, if we can pack things so there's less stranding, we can buy fewer machines, which means when we turn around and, and run sort of external cloud workers on it, we can charge less for them which is why it's an interesting game for us to be in to try and continue you know, driving the Moore's, Moore's law down in the pricing, pricing system. Internally, we exa see exactly the same kind of benefits. So I've talked about the sort of this universe because that's sort of you know, the, the team I was in. Um, but let's put that in context, right? So imagine each of these boxes is a uh, sort of large-scale distributed service. So the one in the middle, the, the master, is the board master. There were five copies of that. Um, his another picture that one of my colleagues, Cody Smith, drew of what actually goes on inside the Borg ecosystem. Right? Borg, this is the stuff that's around it. I'm not going to go into every box, don't worry, um, other than to notice you know, the, the blue stuff down here is how do you ship bits around, so there's a global file system or distributed file systems in there at different levels. The yellow stuff is security, I'm told it's really good. The, um, <laughs> the red stuff is monitoring, because if you're not monitoring it, you have to assume it's out of control. And the brown stuff is monitoring actual resource allocation, which is the closing the loop around wh who's paying for what and are they getting to use it well. So again, another, another iteration loop. And I've just joined the part of the company that's sort of worrying about those things more now. But the reason to show this graph is that there's to point out that there's a boatload of services that you as a user can rely on. So you could actually see this, right? You can focus on your application running in, inside your uh, container, and then there's all of these sort of services that are available to the outside world, right? I never write storage services. I just go right to one of the standard file systems that's out there. Um, all, of, um, all of those things are just there. They're up, they're running, other people looking after them. And this turns out to make Google developers amazingly productive, right? As you'll see, we keep on churning out new things. The internal joke is we churn out new things before we finish getting rid of the old one. Uh, that's okay. Sorry, after we get rid of the old one. Um, but the result is that that model of doing stuff with containers is far more effective for us than having people, let's say, bring up their own virtual machines and then doing antivirus patching on the OSs and making sure they've got the right configuration knobs. No, 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 that's crazy talk. Let's have people work on the bit that they, where they can add value and have the rest of the system provide them with services that they can lean on and take advantage of. And that model turned out to be a really good one. We do it with containers. And then Docker comes along and says, great, here's a nice packaging model for a bunch of technologies that ma it makes it really convenient to describe something that looks quite like our configuration files and say, you can run a container either on your desktop for debugging or you can push it out somewhere else and run it. And we went, excellent. Let's use that as the excuse to do an open source version of Borg Lite. And we called it Kubernetes which is Greek for helmsman or pilot of a, of a ship. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago now, I guess. It's something like the top 0.01% of all GitHub projects. There's so over a thousand unique contributors now, um, and it's quite popular. It's written in Go, uh, Apache 2.0 license. You can download it. We would love to have more people both using it and contributing to it. And the slogan here is Kubernetes everywhere, right? It will run on premises in your own hardware. It will run on the, uh, the cloud, both ours and other people's, and will provide a hosted service, which I'll come back to in a minute, where you can run, uh, we'll run Kubernetes for you. So this is going to be very quick because it's going to be very familiar here. So how does Kubernetes behave? Well, it takes a pile of machines, physical or virtual, it doesn't matter, and it puts an agent on every single one. Hmm. Yep. Um, but you don't have to worry about which one because we're going to deal with that. Just like in Borg, you didn't know which machine you were going to land on. In Kubernetes, you don't need to know which machine you're going to land on here either. 
and you take your applications, in our case I'm going to take two of them and, and lump them together into this scheduling unit we call a pod. I didn't have time to talk about it, but that's exactly how we do things inter internally. We'll, we'll put something like a complicated engine with a very simple log scraper, which you might want to keep running even if the complicated engine goes away and they want to be glued together. And you'll submit this to uh, a master, in our case extra for Kubernetes use etcd rather than Paxos, but the idea is exactly the same. That master uses the same kind of let me compare the reality against what I want to be true and fix it that I talked about before, that reconciliation loop idea, which makes the thing very resilient. So any part can go down and come back <coughs> up again and just pack up, pick up where it left off. And the master chooses where things to go. It does the same kind of bin packing. But we also realized that we'd made a few mistakes in our decades worth of, of building Borg. And you know, it was a great system to get started with, but it's a little hard for us to change internally now because we have gazillions of customers that use it and you know, making alterations is hard. But there's no reason to make the same mistakes externally. So let's put in a few new things into Kubernetes we didn't have. And here's one of them. So Borg has this notion of a job, a, a vector of tasks which are basically all identical. What happens if you want to nest them? Eh, you're screwed. What happens if you want overlaps? Eh. You're screwed. There's nothing you can do. That's, o that's the only grouping mechanism we have. So what people do is they invent creative job names with, you know, regular expression parsing of strings. <laughs> Bad idea. Um, so Kubernetes does something else. It says, we'll let you put a label on anything you like, particular pods. And a label is just a key value pair. You get to choose the key, you get to choose the value. There's limits to stop you using the thing as a key value store, but fine. Um, and then you get to say, great, Find me all the things that have this match this selector. So think a, sort of a, a very lightweight SQL query or a, a sort of Venn diagram. Find me all the things that have role front end. Great, they're the yellow ones. B's back end. Find me all the things that are in stage production. So again, think Venn diagrams and a sort of, um, a sort of overlapping sets. This is the way you group things in Kubernetes. You don't have jobs, you just have sets of, of, of pods that with these properties. So now you could do things like find me all of those things and upgrade them to the next version. Or set up a monitoring system that is looking at them because I want to know what the RPC performance is like. So every time there's a grouping operation in Kubernetes, it uses one of these label selectors <coughs> plus the labels that you can put on. So that's actually much more flexible than, than Borg ever was with this kind of stuff. In fact, so much so that we're retrofitting some of these ideas into the Borg world. Here's the other idea. So Borg, you come along to the Borg master, the one Borg master, times five copies, and say, I want to have 40 copies of my thing, or 1,000 copies of my thing, or 10,000. And you have, to go to Borg, you have to talk to Borg master to get it to decide how to do that. Well, great, but sometimes you want different behaviors. So we separated out a bunch of stuff that was part of the monolithic Borg master into separate microservices in the Kubernetes world. And one of the microservices is in charge of saying, how many copies do I want? So you can go to this thing, what we call a replica controller, and you can say, make me three copies of that. You give it a template. And it does exactly the thing we talked about before. It looks, using a label to set selector, to say how many copies are out there. If the answer is three, it says, great, do nothing. If the answers are not three, it fixes it. Repeat. There's about three different flavors of, of replica selector. One of, the, one of them is for things like demons. I want one of these running everywhere, which turns out to be quite a useful pattern for, for things like storage systems. If you change it to four, it decides there are only three, let me add one, great. So that's a separate component. If you don't like the one we give you, or the four we give you, write your own. Maybe you can just drop it in, it's really easy. Here's something else that we didn't do in Borg. We didn't provide a front-end load balancing system for everything, so you had to do this yourself. So typically what people run is they, they use one of our load balancing services internally. But let's make, so Kubernetes says, no, no, that's silly, let's make that a first-class object. So you can actually explicitly say, here's one IP address, or sort of one DNS name for all some number behind the scenes of backends. You don't have to care. You always go through this single point of entry, and we'll worry about the load balancing, and it just works very nicely. And again, it uses label selectors to say, here's my backends that I'm willing to, search, to, to serve over. Okay, so by now you've sort of basically got the theme, right? There's an awful lot of stuff that was in Borg that has made its way out into Kubernetes. In fact, many of the, my colleagues in Borg are now Kubernetes developers. They didn't even move. They just you know, switched left a little. Um, so you'll see containers, right? You'll see pods, which I mean, these are all things that, that have exact analogs in the Borg world. The kubelet is the same thing as the Borglet. The sort of reconciliation loops around persistent storage where you know what it is you want to be true. But we've added a few new things. Labels we've talked about, services we've touched on, the idea of being able to compose and bind things together late in the system rather than having it built in one way. And then the other thing that's changed in the decades since we started Borg is we can now afford one IP address per pod. So we do. 
it turns out that makes things so much easier because we can just use off-the-shelf stuff like DNS, whereas internally we had to write our own equivalent. So how can you get it? Well, there's two flavors of Kubernetes. Uh, one is just, here's a pile of source, GitHub, off you go. Good luck. We wish you well. There's some, some documentation. Um, <laughs> Some of which might be out of date, who knows? It's, it's a very Google thing. But it's completely open source, right? We, we have a huge community of people contributing to it. Up to, we are now the minority c committers to, to Kubernetes by far, which is great that the community has come together and, and decided it's a really great thing to go. And it runs in lots of different places, and we have various other people helping us out with those things. Or, you, so you could either run it on premises, or you could run it on uh, Google Container Engine, you could just rent VMs and, and bring up a copy of Kubernetes yourself. Um, it runs on GCE, it runs on Amazon, it runs on you know that sort of stuff. If you give it to us, we'll actually run a hosted service. There's a thing called Google Container Engine, which is where we'll run the master. We'll do that sort of stuff. We'll also do backups, we'll also do monitoring, we'll omit all of that stuff so you don't have to. You just say, create me a Kubernetes cluster, and then you say, could you run this pod? And, and that, that's it, that's all you have to do. And you know, behind the scenes, we'll do stuff. We'll, we'll crank up VMs and all, all those kind of things. We'll tear them down again when necessary. Um, so again, you don't have to, right? This is delegation in that service model I showed you earlier with that, that picture of all of those little boxes. Let somebody else do stuff they know how to do. You have better things to do with your day. So here's where it fits into sort of the, the, the architecture of, of the universe. On the right-hand side, you know, if you want raw bits, raw physical hardware for yourself, or virtual hardware for yourself, good luck. Go for it, absolutely. Knock yourself out. There's some things which work really well in that environment. Uh, rent a VM by the, by the minute. Cool. On the left-hand side, and if you don't care about all that kind of junk, you just want to run a, a web service, um, App Engine. I'm actually an internal App Engine user. It's wonderful. I don't even have to worry about this stuff. It auto-scales. It just configures. It does back. I mean, great. But it's very opinionated. If you don't like its opinion, it's a little hard to change. And then Kubernetes is somewhere in the middle, right? It will run containers for you. You can put anything you like in those containers. It's entirely up to you. If it fits in a Docker container, it'll run just fine in Kubernetes. The nice thing about this is that you can write to the same API, whether you're going to deploy on on-premises, deploy on top of rented VMs, or deploy on Google Container Engine. And the programmers and developers amongst you don't have to change what you do. You just change the configuration about where you want it to run. So this, this is the idea behind Kubernetes everywhere, right? The same API is used for everything, which gives you flexibility about what you want to do, and gives us a chance to sort of bid for some of your money, right? We, we'd love to get it. But we think by helping everybody, we're going to you know, get some fraction of that, and this is business positive for us. And it turns out it's working very well. Um, GKE is growing faster than our VM business. Mm. OK, so last slide. Um, three things I want you to remember. Resiliency, resiliency, resiliency. If you don't get that right, nothing else matters. So worry about failure tolerance right up front. Worry about for every single conversation you have. Worry about what will happen if that breaks when I'm doing this thing that is touchy. And think through what the consequences are. It's not okay to say, we'll deal with it on the day. Because when the day comes, it's going to be unpleasant. Um, and that's not the time you actually want to be thinking through some of those subtle interactions. Right? <laughs> um, so ubiquity thinking about all the things that could go wrong. And when you get to large scale, you'll, you'll discover is that they will be begin to happen. Uh, we, we have people who shoot uh, terabit scale fiber optic lines and take an entire data center offline instantaneously. We, have sh we used to have sharks that would eat su uh, submarine cables and do much the same thing. Apparently they like the electromagnetic interference. Fiber helps. Um, and so on. But, um, and software bugs, right? Sof correlated software bugs are problems. So you have to think about how do you, how do you bound these kinds of things. <coughs> Once you've got stuff up, we can come back and have a conversation about how do you make it more efficient. There are very few organizations that should be worrying about efficiency before they've got a really positive business case. You have to be using an awful lot of cloud computing resources before you should be worrying about your budget. That budget is tiny compared to the cost of your engineers. So make them more productive. Once you get to the point where you're big enough to have a problem where your budget on buying cloud computing is big, Great, that's a wonderful problem to have, <laughs> right? Um, come talk to us, we'll, we'll cut some special deals. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe help you. So for example, we, you probably know that Pokemon runs on Kubernetes, right? GKE. We were running around there, I, I don't know if you heard the story, but the, um, they made an estimate of what they thought their initial load was gonna be, and then we said, come on, bump it up. So they multiplied it by three. The actual load was like 50X their estimate. 
And there was a couple of hours where we were scrambling to give them enough virtual machines to run on, but a couple of hours out of the first few weeks. It's nice to have people willing to help you out. This is what the Cloud Computing Universe is for, right? Sort of, you don't have to worry about scale. It just works. Behind the scenes, we're scrambling like crazy, but you know, <laughs> that's what makes my life fun. Um, if, if it was all easy, it wouldn't be interesting. Great. But then our job behind the scenes is to do exactly that, right? We want to give you the flexibility that you want to be able to take advantage of so you don't have to worry about it. We want to make things as efficient as possible so we can charge as little money as we can for it so you will use more of it, so etc. right? Um, for us, that works by sharing things rather than by partitioning them, by reclaiming unused resources so that we can say, look, you know, we, we can't sell this as a full priced, high quality, high SLO thing, but we can sell it as a low uh, sort of quality thing for running batch jobs or preemptible VMs in our case. Um, and we do other, other tricks behind the scenes, sort of try and make sure we do really good bin packing to make sure that, you, that we get good cost effic effectiveness out of our hardware. And then the last slogan is this notion of, you know, Kubernetes everywhere is, is a good thing because it makes developers productive, right? It's, it, it's, it's to help you, right? We think you will find it useful. Whether you do it on top of our environment or not, I would encourage you to take a look. Um, it's a great system to bring stuff up on. Uh, we love contributions, but if you just want to be a user, please, I mean, take, take advantage of the things that other people around you are doing. Thank you. That's it. Be happy to take questions. Um, yeah, let's start with the questions from the app. We also don't have so much time, but um, how do you see AI or deep learning affect these kinds of systems? Oh, yes. Um, Google is very fond on machine learning right now. Uh, there are many people around me with very big hammers. And they're looking for nails to strike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, I, I think you'll see machine learning c uh, coming into, initially it's sort of starting stuff like making projections. We make sort of multi-month projections of how many spare resources we're going to have in a cell so we can sell that to people who care about multi-month availability of stuff. Uh, you'll find a paper we published about this a couple of years ago. <laughs> so I th expect machine learning is going to be coming into places like that to improve the quality of those predictions. Um, you could also see it sort of trying to say, you know, making basic predictions of, w we've seen this in the past, what's it going to do in the future? Right? Being able to say, look, I've seen this job every hour for the last four weeks. I'm pretty good at guessing what I think it's going to do next. And if you can make good predictions like that, using machine learning techniques or whatever else you can come up with, it turns out you can then do a better job of efficiency and bin packing. So those are the sort of easy low-hanging fruit. And there's a bunch of other things to do with sort of how do you set your configuration knobs and stuff like that. But the, the people are looking at these kind of things internally. We have some very nice machine learning technology, um, so I'm sure we'll find a way to use it. Okay. Um, do you use Kubernetes internally or continue to use Borg? If you do, do you use an internal fork or the one from GitHub? <laughs> um, we, most people inside Google use Borg because it gives you much, I mean I told you it was Kubernetes is Borg light, right? If you've become addicted to the 240 odd parameters you can specify for a job in Borg, it's very hard to let go of those things. I mean they're there because they add efficiency. You know, each one saves Gmail half a percent of resources or something. Um, so most people use it internally. We, the other thing that has only recently sort of been the case, well, un until fairly recently, our uh, sort of access management controls were not quite good enough for Google's standards, but with the release of the IAM products that came out in the last few months, we're actually ex explicitly doing some experiments of trying to take something that's kind of important to us, evolving, let's just say, <coughs> payroll, and moving it into the cloud on our existing cloud platform. Once we've got that working and can demonstrate it to our security people's satisfaction, I think you will find we, in fact, I know we will find there's a bunch of people inside Google who've been saying, can I use Kubernetes, can I use Kubernetes? And the answer is no, back, um, until we can make sure it's absolutely secure to the kind of level of security that we want to be able to have for our own internal stuff, which is amazing. External stuff is really good, but it doesn't have the flexibility. I mean, it's secure, it just doesn't have the flexibility that you need for sort of essentially an enterprise scale interactions. And that's what the IAM products have just produced in the last few months. So yes, we're going to see more of those. Okay. Um Maybe one question from the audience. Sure. I'll be around the way that. afterwards for a while if you want to. Okay. I just run. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, is reclamation, is reclamation coming to uh, Kubernetes? So I couldn't hear that beginning, something coming to Kubernetes? Reclamation. Reclamation? Uh, it's open source. 
No, no, I mean, you're talking, <laughs> in your talk you talked about um, putting like batch jobs into this, the, the, the sort of spare area. Is that same technique going to come to Kubernetes? It may, it may well. I honestly, to be honest, I don't know. I have not been active in the Kubernetes team for a little while. Uh, but, you know, their plans are public. We just, the 1.4 stuff came out fairly recently. I'm sure they're talking about what goes into 1.5. A lot of it has to do with, you know, what people think is the most important thing. Right now, I know some of the people are working on scale. The last number I was allowed, I was told I was allowed to say, was we've got 2,000 working, we're doing 3,000 right now. We expect to have 5,000 machines uh, for, for Kubernetes support. So, it may, reclamation may well be on the, I'm sure it's on the, I know it's on the list. I just don't know where on the list it is. Sure. <laughs> So, d sorry, if you're interested, David Oppenheimer and the Kubernetes team will be the guy to ask. He wrote a bunch of the scheduling stuff that I talked about at the Borg world as well. All right, All right. thank you very much, everybody. Yep.